everybody? Yes. Okay. I just need one person to respond. All right. So in the past, we kind of been calling this uh, a pre-functional review, but at, when I went and I reviewed the actual um, definition of done that the company owns, here, I'll show you. Oh, wait, no, that's not it. What is that? Oh, that's DevOps. Why did that go to DevOps? Crap. Where's the actual company's definition of done? I linked the wrong thing. Here's the company's definition of done. And uh, their functional, oh, here it is. Their functional review was after the code was done. They didn't have anything before. So uh, I went with calling it a functional review <clears throat> for after the fact. And then I created the new name called uh, define acceptance, acceptance tests as the first thing that we do. Okay, so you'll see that there's acceptance, define acceptance tests, also known as design implementation or pre-functional review. Some other teams call it design implementation. And then you have the functional review, which is also known to us as the post-functional review. Okay, so this is, this is pre, the developers are into the code big time implementing, and this one's post, devs are done, they wanna now review it before it, it, it is cleared by the QA. So let me just go over some of the things with, with, with what, after discussing a lot of this with the team during retros and some things that I came up with too, kind of what I'm expecting, and then maybe we can disagree or agree. How about that? So developer works with QA assigned to come up with all possible testing permutations and or use cases related to the item being fixed, implemented, or created. Okay, the purpose of this really is to, 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 to have that conversation between QA and, and dev in more detail than what we can do during grooming, right? Grooming, we just want to kind of, we want to get the, the acceptance criteria up there, the basic acceptance criteria, so we can quickly estimate and go through grooming those tickets. This is, this is where we do a deep dive to really decompose what are the actual tests that need to be ran? What are the actual risks in detail uh, that, that, that need to be addressed? And that can, that, that discussion doesn't have a time limit, I don't think. I think, I feel that discussion should take as long as it needs to take, okay? Whether that be short or an hour long, I don't know. So the purpose, these permutations, or the test cases we're calling them, should be used to generate unit and integration tests and guide manual testing in satisfying the defined acceptance criteria. It is encouraged to modify the acceptance criteria at this point, if needed, with the approval from the product owner. So this is kind of an old rule, but if you ever go and modify the acceptance criteria during the sprint, when you've already committed to it as a team, you need to verify that with, with the PO and the QA that you're working with, right? You wanna just go change acceptance criteria willy nilly. But I feel that the test cases, however, those can fluctuate and change, and you don't need to verify that with the PO every time, because the test cases should always satisfy the acceptance criteria, okay? Uh, what does this look like on a ticket? Um, you guys have kind of seen it. We have an actual, or Joseph has been, has been putting together some templates for us, to, for us to reference. So as an example, under a story, um, we have the acceptance criteria, and then we have the decomposed acceptance test cases. And mostly these will be blank until the story is pulled into the sprint and a developer actually pulls a QA in and they, and they, de they uh, take the, the acceptance criteria and they decompose, decompose, did I spell that right? Yeah, and they decompose those into those bullet points, okay? That's kind of what we're kind of getting at here. All right, so decompose your ticket acceptance criteria into test cases. There will be cases where you will have more test cases that satisfy just one acceptance criteria, so don't be alarmed. You know, it, it's not a one-to-one -one thing. You'll, you'll probably have more test cases than there are acceptance criteria. The test cases should be fluent. Developer and QA shouldn't feel like those are in set in stone. They should be adjusted as the developer implements the feature and discusses that with the QA assigned. However, if the acceptance criteria needs to change, that discussion needs to include the PO. So I kind of mentioned that already. Um, unit and uh, any, any questions so far from the team? Any disagreements? No, I, I would just like to add, um, I would like to see us, right? So if we define test cases as part of that, um, I would like to see us write those in test rail or have them 
you know, done, you know, earlier rather than later. Is what I'm okay. Saying. So you're talking about test, like uh, test rail test cases is what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. If we're Do those writing, mimic, should those mimic these? Should they be the probably, same? Yeah. Okay. I mean, so ideally, I guess, yeah. We, sometimes we have existing tests that can cover it, but you know, like what we're doing now is basically new stuff. So we have to put stuff in there. Okay. <clears throat> is there a place in those test cases in test rel that, that say these are automated or not? Like this was a run by automation? Um, yes and no. There, there's a priority I th or a, oh, I don't remember what it is. It's, it's a number that you put, but it, it doesn't mean anything. Like it doesn't actually. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't. I also put automated in the title if we automate them. Well, maybe that should be a discussion. Should we be placing, should we but be doing th this? There's also, theory? so if we do just say looking forward, and if I'm derailing this, let me know and I can talk to you later. But you can, when you do a storyteller test, you can also have a C number associated with it. So C numbers are what test rail uses. They're the unique identifier for test rail. So like C number one, for example, is our new uh, MBI thing, right? We can have test or we can have storyteller actually write to test rail. Well, I'm, how does it know which test suite though it's running? I mean, like, can you have multiple instances of that? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I just know that Christian worked on this. This is why I'm I'm less sure on this. We might have to do a little bit of an investigation, but um, he actually went and got every C number and he associated that with a storyteller test. All right. Well, that's good to know. S something for us to consider then down the line. Yeah. I, so to actually mark it off. But I think what you're saying right now, Bateman, the thing you're trying to get across is let's try to get the test cases that we decompose in the ticket here. Let's try to get those in a test row sooner than later is what you're trying yep. to say. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So this is kind of going into some new territory kind of in a way on the way that we've kind of done it, kind of changing the paradigm a little bit on how we've, we've been doing unit tests and how we've been including QA in them. I'm, I'm wanting to kind of flop it, kind of reverse it, um, where we include QA up front in creating these tests. For one, we, we should be following TDD as much as we can, right? Where we write tests that fell first, and then as we implement changes, they, they, they slowly turn to green, right? I'm suggesting for one, we, we try to do that anyway, but let's try to include QA in, in, in creating those failing tests up front. So I'll expand this. Great opportunity for developers in QA to actually write failing integration tests that will later satisfy the acceptance criteria test cases. There will be cases where you will have more in unit integration tests that satisfy just one test case in the JIRA ticket, okay? So you have, you have like, let's just go with the number one here. You have one acceptance criteria. You then can have two or more test cases, and then you can have three or more uh, unit tests slash integration tests, right? They're not one-to-one. -one. Um, okay, so any, any questions on that developers? Do you see a problem with that? It might slow us down a little bit, but my goal is to try to get QA to trust the tests that we're writing more, right? Uh, so that we can um, gain their trust in automation. Any, any feedback from, from the devs on that or QA? I have a question on this. <clears throat> so what all unit tests should we go through with QA? Is it uh, it's not like suppose uh, consider for example consider household authentication I'm not actually hitting the exact endpoint for that for the unit test and uh, what actually I'm doing was stubbing that so how 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 will that be useful for QA uh, to be confident about that this works that's just testing that what code I have written for IFP works right so how will QA be confident about that that this works so in that example, Monica, um, I still feel it's valuable to include QA, the QA assigned person, right? I'm not saying to include all QA because I think that would be too, too, too time, um, uh, not wasted, but too much time involved. I'm kind of leaning more towards, and I'm kind of going on a tangent real quick. I'm kind of suggesting that we use, that, that the person that's 
the two people that are together in this little powwow is the assigned dev and the assigned QA. Um, I'm not saying it has to be that case all the time, but I'm saying it should probably be that. And then uh, when we do the functional review, that's when we include all the QA because that's the QA's PR per se. You know, as us as developers, um, yes, we pair, but a lot of times we don't and we work on an item alone, but we still get feedback from all the developers when we do the PR. I'm, I'm suggesting that the functional review is also a PR for the, is, is like a PR for the QA. Okay, so with that, um, when I say QA in this context, I'm meaning the QA assigned person, um, I, I still feel it's valuable to include them in that, but make them aware that the, of the context where this unit test or this, this halfway integration test is mocking out the auth service. So QA individual, you probably need to do some manual testing in this specific, for this specific test because it doesn't go all the way to the auth service. So it's a discussion, Monica. It's a discussion where you identify with the QA which tests are full integration tests or which tests are enough that that, that risk is gone, that the risk of it failing is mitigated, right? So I think it just depends, Monica. It's not a, it's not a black or white. I feel it's a discussion that needs to happen so that the QA can help the developer and the developer help the QA understand what tests can be automated and what tests need to still be manually tested. And at this point right now, we don't have any confidence really from QA, right? And I'm being kind of harsh about that, but we don't. And so really QA, QA is still gonna do manual testing, even though we might have some automated tests that cover it, right? And I'm hoping as we prove ourselves, we can, we can slowly uh, swing that pendulum, okay? Does that answer your question, Monica? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would just echo exactly what Brady said too, is, right, like, if there is an, you know, we know, we know that if there's not integration tests and you're stubbing it, that's important to know because that's a risk, right? The integration right. is a risk. So it's awesome to identify that. So, and I agree with everything Brady said. Yes, yeah, thank you, Joseph. So, so yeah, when you're taught, when, when you're looking at the acceptance criteria in the ticket and you're talking it out with the QA and saying, look, I think we think we need this test. I think we need this test. I think we need this test. As you talk about those and write them down in the JIRA ticket, identify which ones still need manual testing. Um, it, it doesn't mean that QA can't manually test one of the items. It's up to, up to them what they're going to manual test, but at least identify together which ones could be um, cleared by automation. All right. Okay, uh, where did I leave off you guys? Did I, there will be cases where you have, oh yeah, so there'll be cases where you have more unit tests. The test cases should be the source of truth for tests created in code. If a unit integration test changes, update its corresponding item in JIRA ticket, because that will help the QA also kind of track what tests they need to do. Because you might, as you're developing in your cave and QA is off doing something else, you might think, oh crap, we forgot to do this test or we forgot to do that. That should invoke you to add it to the JIRA ticket and, and confirm with that QA assigned. So the QA person is aware, oh, I forgot about this, or we forgot about this. What do you think? And, and the QA person at that moment might even say, well, did you think about this? Or did you think about that? It's a great time to have that conversation again. So I guess what I'm getting at is uh, those, those test cases should be fluent. They should be organic. They should change as you're implementing the, uh, the uh, ticket. And that change should involve the, the, the assigned QA person. So by the time you get to the functional review, that assigned QA person already knows everything you're doing. They already know all the tests you're doing. Um, and really the functional review is for the other QA who haven't been involved and, and for the PO, right? That's really what the functional review is for. You should be in constant conversation with, with, with the assigned QA person, individual, as you implement it. That's kind of what that's saying there. All right. Moving on to the next one, decompose, and if anybody has any questions, just, just, just interrupt me. Decompose JIRA ticket subtask for implementation details. So this is something that came from me working with Mike a little bit. Um, and I'll go more into detail on this on, on the developer page, but just, just, just for an overarching view, um, when you do this, uh, this step, either right when you start working on the ticket or soon thereafter, right? 
we need to decompose those subtasks. Now in the past, we've, we've tried to do that during planning, but I've noticed we haven't really had a lot of time and we kind of rushed through it and we don't know enough about the ticket yet because we're not in the weeds yet that we can't really create good subtasks, implementation subtasks, right? Um, I, I do feel it's important um, to have the Scrum Master uh, during planning or right after planning to add the, the uh, default tasks that we have. The default tasks are like the, the subtasks that QA have, but they're also some of these other subtasks like defined acceptance tests and stuff like that. I, I think those are important to add um, during planning. Here, let me show you guys what those are. If, if you guys aren't aware, I'll show you where the template is and how you do it real quick. Um, let me just go into a, actually, I'll go, for those that aren't aware, this is how you actually get to the templates. You go to projects and you go to here and you go to subtask templates. And there's a lot of people that have some, but team six here is ours. This is our summarized one. But if you look, the first how subtask is gonna create is define acceptance tests. Then you have implementation, decompose the subtask. What that means is, you should either rename this dev subtask or make it into multiple ones. It shouldn't, we, sh we shouldn't see a subtask like this completed. Oh, and I'll go into that more detail. You, you got your functional review and then all the QA subtasks, right? So I'd like to see us right after planning, make sure that all the tickets that we commit to have these default subtasks to it, but this one won't yet be decomposed. This subtask will remain like this until you have that first powwow with, with your QA. And, and it's at that moment that you decompose these subtasks, okay? That's kind of what I'm getting at here. So decompose JIRA ticket subtasks for implementation details. Decompose development implementation into committable subtasks, keeping the decomposed acceptable criteria case in mind. Prefix, uh, so this is gonna help with um, just sorting. If you can, if you forget, it's fine. I know. I'm adding process here and we don't like process, but if possible, when you're creating a, a development implementation subtask, prefix it with this dev uh, bracket, bracket dev bracket, that'll help um, us uh, show that in our, in our JIRA board and kind of easily visually see between what's a, what's a QA task or, or a definition of done task or, and what's an actual implementation task. So if you can add that, if uh, GitHub implementation issue is linked to the ticket, review it with a team lead. Um, I'm starting to create uh, GitHub implementation issue tickets so that we don't have our tickets full of development implementation. Um, what I'm saying here is just when you're, when you're decomposing those subtasks, reference that implementation ticket because that implementation ticket is gonna have details in there that will help you create subtasks that are valuable, that, that provide value. If working with another developer, so this kind of comes from me working with Mike, right, Mike? <laughs> uh, and maybe you can give your experience later. If working with another developer, it's important so that we don't step on each other's toes. It's important that these that these tickets are, or I'm sorry, these these subtasks are decomposed in a way that they can be worked on in parallel, and also committed in parallel. Um, try to try to be creative in how you how you write them and create them so that one developer can work in one piece of the code and commit it and not cause a big merging issue with the other developer okay um and this suggestions process is going to be another page so i'll go over that in more detail make sure to break out the subtasks in a way that they can be worked on and committed independently if a standard team subtasks is missing at them. So if, if you're seeing that one of those standard template tasks aren't there, this is also the time to add them. So pretty much this session is where you get together, you first create the test cases, review with the QA, come up with what you need to test. Um, and then if you wanna be even awesomer, even create those failing tests right then and there with that QA person uh, using the TDD uh, behavior, right? Where you write failing tests first before you do anything. Now, I know that's not possible all the time, but if we could start doing this discipline and practicing it, it's going to make a huge difference and we'll get donuts from Crandall, uh, which by the way, I still owe Andrew a donut for winning the best office. I plan on having that next week for you, Andrew. 
And then um, with, you might not have to do this with, with the QA person, but if you want to, you can. He can still help you. He or she can help you. But it, for sure, if you're pairing with another dev, make sure that you sit down and de decompose those subtasks during that session as well. Um, if a bug, just, just note this, if a bug, it's at this state, it's in this specific session that you um, review your implementation with the team lead, with the UX, PO, and QA, and fill out the root cause analysis as well. This, this actually comes from uh, previous uh, lives where we were working on more, more, more bugs. Okay, so any questions on this session that you'll have with the QA assigned developers? Any questions, QA? If not, I'm gonna move on. Okay, great. None for me. Okay, so then after you've done all your code work, you've been talking with the QA signed person as you implement developers, and um, nothing should be a surprise for that QA person. Uh, you, you throw up your PR, you're almost ready to merge into master, or let's say maybe even the team environment. Uh, you do a functional review, and that's where you get all the QA together all the, P, the, the, the PO together and the UX if necessary. Now, if you feel your code needs to be also reviewed in like a code review uh, session, kind of like how we've done with bigger code projects, it's a great time just to kind of combine it with this. But this functional review shouldn't be a code review. It's a very, it's a more higher level than that. You shouldn't be going through in detail your code. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. If you are, uh, you know, don't fret, but, 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 but just keep that in mind. So the purpose of this, and this actually comes from the company's definition of done, of a, of a functional review, demonstrate to the PO all defined acceptance tests and how they, how they satisfy the acceptance criteria. This allows for a quicker feedback loop, avoiding unnecessary feature defects and redeployments in the team environment, in, in QA, and so on and so forth, okay? Um, it's, it's that whole shifting left. This should be done before you push to the team environment. So I'm saying it should be done before the team environment. I, I don't think that should be like a hard rule, but try to do it. Um, if you feel you can't demo this on your local box, um, and you can only do it in the team environment, then, it, then of course you need to push it to the team environment first and then do a functional review, right? But if, if all possible, trying to shift left even more, demo it on your box. If a small change, skipping the developer's box is not, oh, I say it right there, small option, but still reviewing the change in team environment required. So here's some steps. Walk through each decomposed test case, identifying the defined acceptance test session, matching them up with the integration unit tests. Now, if you have like a bazillion integration unit tests, try to summarize it, right? But I have seen value in walking through with QA, here's what the test is doing. Um, you don't have to go into great, great detail. Just kind of explain the steps that, that it's doing. And the whole purpose of this, because you already should have gained trust on the assigned QA person when you were working on the ticket. But the purpose here is to gain the trust of the other QA on the test that you just wrote so that we can get that pendulum swung and start using automated testing to, to actually clear items. I'm not saying we're there yet at all, but if we can start that, that'd be great. When walking through each test, don't go into much details, make it a code, don't make it a code review, but still explain how each automated test is asserting. Main objective is to allow the assigned QA to gain trust, okay? This should be, this should help solidify trust also in the rest of the QA, oh, I, okay, I mentioned that. Um, who are not assigned to the ticket and not present during the defined acceptance test session. Identify which test cases can be cleared by automated tests and which need to be cleared manually. Now it's good to review this because you're probably gonna have other QA that weren't in the beginning meeting who are gonna help clear this item in the other environment. So it's good to kind of clarify that. For those tests that need to be manually cleared, clear, the developer walks the QA through the process. So that, this is great here too, because a lot of times we're in the team environment and the developer just deploys it and then QA is like, okay, how do I test this again? Um, what are the steps? It'd be good if we talked about that way before. Again, shifting left. Um, so this is where you talk about it. This is where you demo to the QA developers, this is how you clear it. This is how I feel you should do it, right? And also demoing, demoing that to the PO and the UX if necessary. It is encouraged that all QA and the team attend. This is similar to the developer's pull request. 
allowing all QA to ask questions and become familiar with what they will be assisting and clearing once the ticket is in the pipeline. Okay, any questions on that? Any concerns? Uh, any great con in that, in the second to last bullet point, <coughs> uh -huh. which takes, uh, it says in their document, the jury ticket. Um, I would suggest maybe updating that to test well, maybe. Uh, specific steps or uh, specific documentation on how how they're going to do that manually. Oh, you mean how how are they going to clear it? Like you know, with Postman. Okay, here's the steps you take to do yeah, it. Yeah, like here's yeah specific. Yeah, you know, I would I I would say leave that up to the assigned developer in QA whether or not it needs to be because um, some things we we've done so many times. There's no reason to document it every time. I would. Yes, Mike, I can add that, but I'm not going to say it's a requirement. Unless you could you say uh, as appropriate or where. Yeah, needed. yeah, yeah, something like that. Now, these two steps that I'm talking about here, it's going to take a little bit more time. This is going to slow us down a little bit. Do you guys see that as a problem or do you see it as uh, changing our discipline to provide less defects and ultimately better quality how do you guys feel about that or do you feel against this completely developers qa uh, I can if no speak one's for, go ahead mike i can speak so uh i think this is a great direction i know from mason uh he wants us to try to concentrate on shift left um i created an objective uh about adhering to this um so uh, for me, I'm, I'm a, yeah, I'm, I'm a big supporter of this. Okay. Uh, not hearing anything else from anyone else. I'm assuming then you guys are in support of this and you're willing to try this out. I am. If you're interested in QA's opinion. Okay. Yep. Yeah, me too. I mean, this is what managers management is wanting us to do. And this is, you know, a good process. So yes. Okay. Yeah, Monica, Andrew. Thank you, Matt. I'm fine with this. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to go with Andrew's silence is yes. Okay, so I'm going to go into now. Now, if QA wants to drop off, you may. But if you want to listen in, you can. This is kind of going into a little bit of changes that are coming from the other team leads as well that we'd like to try. And also um, some um, suggestions and counsel on how you pair and how you kind of manage the commits and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, working with the team, just make sure you're aware of our team expectations and norms. Those really haven't changed since we've reviewed it. But if you forgot, just know that that's there. That's under our team page under expectations right here. Okay. Working with QA, pretty much what we just reviewed, but I had it here as well. Before you begin on a ticket, have a defined acceptance test session. It's uh, with the assigned QA person. It's, it's an actual subtask that we're going to start adding to all of our tickets. Flush out the test cases and create failing unit tests with the QA person so that they can gain confidence in the automated tests. I think when I wrote this, I wasn't sure if it was QA person, QA technician, QA specialist. I go back and change that. After implementation, have a functional review with all QA, PO, and UX reviewing your work on your local box and reviewing all automated tests to satisfy the test cases and acceptance criteria. So that's what we just reviewed. Okay, let's talk about feature branches. This is a change, you guys, kind of. I like us to try it. When creating a feature branch, as we've been doing, use the ticket name, uppercase, but let's add a description. This is coming from the IFP team leads. Um, we'd like to see a small descriptions added to the branch name. Okay, so developers, uh, any, any qualms about that? Are you okay doing that from here, from moving here forward? I thought we were already doing that. That's what I've done for my current branch. Yeah, some, some of us have been doing it. I've been doing it. Um, uh, some of us haven't. So, um, question: ad hoc fixes, you know, for fixing something, you know, like something needs to be done in QA that was found. We're in the pipeline, um, and we need to quickly create uh, a, a branch to to fix a small item, you know, that uh, QA found. What, it's it's should, still it, it's still attached to a ticket, is it not? Okay. Yeah, but what should be the branch be called in that case? TW-1234 fixed. Okay, so the still the bad thing. I've seen I've seen I've seen 
people not use that, you know, prefix. So. Oh yeah, you'll 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 see other teams do it. You know, even us. But the suggestion is to to, to use this format from here moving forward. Okay. All right. Commits. Um, use a short commit title. So this is something I think we need to work on as a team. Uh, followed by a detailed commit body. So instead of having a very lengthy commit, and maybe I can show you guys some examples. And this is something that Sam Merrill actually went over when he did his little PR, you know, how to how to create a pull request uh, presentation. And he this kind of comes from his suggestions as well. Uh, let me go to one exchange. And let's just see who I can pick on. Let's see here. Okay, so here's a good example of a commit message. She has a short, now whether or not you do the title at the front, we're gonna talk about that via ticket number. Um, but here, okay, well, it's, it's a short title. She didn't include in any description. Let me see if I can find one that has a description in it. Okay, here's a good example. Short title, description of what you're doing. That can either be a bullet list or just a, just a body. This is what we want. This is what, this is what we want you guys to be doing. Now, I like, this is kind of more of a perf personal preference, and if we can keep it the same on the team, I'd appreciate it. I like to have the ticket number at the bottom. I know in the past we said to have the ticket number in the top of the title. Uh, um, we'd like to see that now at the bottom. Well, for sure, all the team leads agree pretty much that we shouldn't have the ticket number in the title because it doesn't allow us to have a lengthy title. Uh, but whether, but some some developers will 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 put the ticket number at the top of the description or the bottom. I prefer it at the bottom. I'm not going to hold you guys to it. I'm not going to hold you to fire. But if you, but if if you remember, I'd like to have it at the bottom instead. Okay. But again, this this isn't the main the main thing I want you to come out of this is a short description, and then I'm I'm sorry, a, a short title and then a description. Whether or not you put the ticket anywhere. I, that's really not a big deal. Okay. Any questions on that? Nope. Okay. Pull requests. This is building on what makes good pull requests that Sam Merrill did. Um, and we kind of already um, do a lot of this. Notify all the team or, or notify the devs in the team room. This is something that I don't think we're all doing good on, but we need to start doing it. Assign yourself to the PR. Okay. And then assign the team devs as reviewers. We get email notifications when you do that. And that's a good reminder for us. Uh, and then the team room is just another way to, the more communication you can do, the better. Uh, I'd like to see us start doing this too. Remove any checklists in the PR description that don't pertain to your changes and make sure that you check them off. All those that are in there should be checked off before that PR is merged. That's the whole purpose of that PR description that we have. So. Maybe you guys aren't understanding, or maybe I just need to clarify what I mean by that. Let me go up here. Let me create a PR. Or let me just, well, yeah, I'll just create a PR. Um, da, da, da. Is it going to let me? No, it's not. Dang it. Let me go to a existing PR. How about Monica's? How about we pick on you, Monica? So all this doesn't pertain to your ticket. What I'm saying is you need to remove any of these checklists that, that, that don't pertain to it. And then before we merge, anything that's on here need, needs to be checked off, okay? Yeah, I usually remove all those things, but for this I haven't. Yeah, so that is what that is. Okay, da da da. All team devs must review it before it can be merged. So, what do you guys think about that? That actually comes from our old team norms. All devs must review. We haven't been doing that. Do you think? Do you guys think that's still necessary? That we all need to, all of us need to review a PR for our team before it merges in, or do you think it's still okay if just two review it? I think two is the max for what the OE teams have agreed to, the IFP teams. But should we force or require all of our devs, all four? What do you guys think? Two is fine. I agree with that. I think two is fine because sometimes we don't have everybody and everybody in the team. Yeah. 
I'm going to change that to team devs must review it before it can be merged. Focus us to know what we're doing. So that, that was the purpose to make sure that all devs know what's going on. Yeah, Brady. Mm -hmm. Small English thing. Uh, two should be T W O. Uh, any number that's one through 10 should be spelled out. Anything after 10 uh, should be, uh, then it's actually a number. All right. English major. Okay. <laughs> Uh, when committing, be specific if it's a suggestion or a required fix. So when you're or commenting, sorry, when you're commenting, I think this came from you, Mike, a long time ago. Specify if it's a suggestion or a required fix. Um, it'd be nice if you if if architecture did that. Um, unless your pull request is ready to be reviewed, place a whip in the title. Um, we're, we're we've been doing that. Um, probably. Also, place the ticket number in the title. If you don't feel it's ready yet to be shown to the rest of the IFP teams, please still push up changes in, your, in, in a feature branch so dev team members can comment on your work. However, don't be too worried about your work. Embrace feedback early. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I'm laughing just because there, there's an experience with this. Um, so yeah, if you're if you're pairing with another programmer, don't don't be shy to to push your branch up. Uh, you don't have to create a PR. You can still add comments to to a commits in, in in GitHub. Do not create a new PR when performing refactor work on existing PR. Oh yeah, instead re rebase or just add comments to the existing branch. That way, comments are retained. Um, yeah, so, so instead of creating a whole new, instead of closing a PR and creating a whole new PR, just rebase or do a, um, modify that existing branch. Now, if, the, if it's a drastic change and it requires us to even maybe even close the ticket, then yeah, you need to close the PR. On a con complex pull request, schedule a code review presentation with developers in QA, okay? Um, suggested to include this in the functional review. Okay, any questions on pull requests? No, moving on. Okay, developer pairing. When pairing on a vertical slice ticket with another developer, make sure to- Sorry, Brady, I do, I, Allison, I just had a question. Yes. What about, what about uh, labels? What, what's our- Just follow the default labels that are required in that repo. I think there's a, in the one exchange wiki, there's a place that says, here's the labels to use. Make sure just assign our team, I guess, for sure, that the PR is assigned to the team. But anything else, I just use your best judgment. I don't think there's really any real, okay. supposed to be doing this type of thing. When, okay, when pairing on it, okay, do, so pairing. Do not work directly off of the feature branch, but rather a personal feature branch. And I'll explain what that means below. Subtasks are defined in a way that they can be worked on in order independently of another developer. So when the changes are merged with the other, it doesn't, it doesn't merge mayhem. <clears throat> now you might not be able to get away with that, right? And, and sometimes you might not be able to do that at all. And that just means that you're gonna have to pair, like actually do a real, a real pair where one codes and one looks over the shoulder, right? Um, developer only works on a subtask at a time. Don't pick up multiple subtasks at a time, you should be implementing. If you have to, that means you created those subtasks wrong. Try to make them, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, single responsibility, I, maybe the word is, is what I'm thinking. Um, the developer needs to make sure that all changes for the subtasks are committed to the feature branch so that the other person pairing has those changes. Um, I suggest using gists to help out in kind of doing pseudocode. When, when you sit down and you're decomposing those test cases and you're talking with the other developer and how you're gonna implement this, that's a great time to maybe create a gist or something that you can share and reference. And make sure you put those gist links, if there is, inside the uh, developer implementation detail issues. And um, so, so those those are GitHub issues that I've been documenting implementation details instead of putting those in the tickets. That's what that is. 
not all the time, but have a good balance where you pair on a single subtask, sharing your screen and switching control. Any questions on pairing? I think we'll be able to do it. It'll be a lot easier to do once we're in their office too. All right, when I talk about piece of personal feature branches, this, this helps out when you're, when, when one developer, if you're both working on the same feature branch and campaigning to the same feature branch, it, it, um, if a developer commits to it and pushes it up, and then you on the other side do a git pull, and you have commits that you haven't yet pushed up, it's gonna create a merge, an unnecessary merge that we don't want. Um, so to prevent that, you treat your feature branch as if it's master. So I, th I think I have that here. When working on a, the same feature branch as another developer, do not commit to the feature branch directly. Instead, treat it as it was master, creating your own personal branch off of the feature branch. And what I've seen people done is just use their, their, their last name. So your main feature branch, treat it as master. So here's, here's the main feature branch, right? We got our small description added to the end. You will create a, um, uh, oh, I should probably do, oh no, that's right, yeah. Then you create your, your own off of that master branch. And I see how I just tacked Brady on the end. And then you're gonna commit your work to that until you're ready to um, include it with, with, with what your pair is doing, okay? And it's easy to take your changes. You, you, you just go to the main feature branch and you do a git merge off of your personal branch and then it merges those changes in. And then you push those changes up. You push the changes that you merged into that feature branch up for the other developer to use. Wouldn't that still create an unnecessary merge commit? No, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't create a merge uh, commit? It doesn't because you're not merging. The merge actually does, a, it, it, it just puts the commits on top. Oh, okay. Makes sense? Yeah, because the way I generally would deal with this, at least locally, would be I get the um, latest note out of it, just cherry pick my changes on top or rebase my branch or something like that. Yeah, there's other ways to do it. Okay. Uh, pretty much you want to avoid forcing the other developer to have to uh, do an unnecessary merge. Okay. Okay. If all possible. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. I'm, uh, you had mentioned that you do, at times, you do some uh, rebasing type things with your personal branch. I was wondering if you could describe. You know, well, so, so let's say the other developer commits stuff to the main branch and they push it up, but you're still working on your personal branch and you got to get those changes that he did or she did into your personal branch. You can either do a git stash and just delete your personal branch and recreate it from, from that from that feature branch or you can treat it just like we do with master where we rebase you would do a you would you would go into your into your personal branch right and you would do a git rebase off of the main branch right and that would uh, put your changes on top of it so you just treat it just like a just like a um, like master and that and that also prevents those those unnecessary merges. Okay. Okay. If all possible, keep your subtask small so you can commit small incremental changes to the feature branch. So try not to change too much in your commits when you're working with another dev because uh, you end up taking on multiple subtasks at the same time. And and uh, that just doesn't work well. So try to keep your commits small, try to keep your subtasks small so that you can both work together in parallel. Uh, GitHub developer implementation details. So this is something I'm trying out. Instead of placing um, detailed implementation details in the JIRA ticket, I'm creating GitHub issues for those instead. And on those GitHub issues, we can actually have check boxes where we check things off. And it also allows us to comment back and forth. So it's, I feel it's a better medium for that kind of thing. So such so implementation. Are those yeah. are those uh, issues? Are those created right off of the you know like the one exchange repo or where did, where are they where are the if issues it's if it's if it's an implementation that's happening in one exchange yeah it's it's in the one exchange repo if it's in the household service it's it's there here I'll show you a couple of them so if you go to GitHub let's go to one exchange I have two of them in there right now and I've been I've been prefixing them with implementation so that Jake and Sam 
don't think it's something they need to look at. Um, and I add in the link to the JIRA ticket, a brief description of what needs to happen, and then steps on what needs. And so as you're, as you're, if you're pairing, yet the, the a subtask will probably um, uh, satisfy like multiple, multiple of these items here, right? And they don't have to go in any order. Let's say that one subtask is to, is to um, update the text field. Well, that satisfies this, this one and this one, right? And this and this. But it might not satisfy the request down here. The other developer is going to be working on the request, right? So these don't, don't necessarily correlate one to one with the subtasks or, or, or in priority order, okay? But it's a nice way for you to have really detailed information on, on what you need to work on. You can share that between the team lead, between the architect, between the principal engineer, between the two devs you're working with through comments and stuff. And this is, this is kind of a fluent document. And as you go, check off the stuff that you complete. It's a great way to communicate. So that's kind of what it looks like. I've also been adding the label implementation on here to, so that they don't get too confused. And you'll see the same thing under the household service. Um, I have implementation details as well for, for the tickets that we're working on. The next one that we're going to be working on here is the validation. And it goes through on what needs to happen with validation and stuff. So if I added all this in the JIRA ticket, it'd be massive. And, and I just don't want to do that. So that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Well, it seems like it would be really great. I mean, uh, Joseph, I noticed that you're on uh, these uh, POs and um, PEs. You know, they could easily go and take a look at some of those issues and just just kind of, you know, see if we're heading in the right direction. Yeah, but for me, those are technical. I, I, for me, I'd rather the POs be referencing the JIRA ticket because that's the higher level information. Whatever, whatever changes in the, in the GitHub issue should be changed in the JIRA ticket as well. I'm not saying you add that detail in the JIRA ticket. I'm just saying if you're, if you're modifying something that, 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 that affects the test cases or the acceptance criteria, it should be in the JIRA ticket for the PO to review. So I'm, so I'm kind of disagreeing with you a little bit, Mike, where I don't feel the POs or the PMO should be looking at the, at these issues. Those are, those are for the developers. Okay. Okay. So within the GitHub issue, record detailed to do's that can be checked off by the developers. The subtasks are completed. Label it. Oh, I did. I did say it. Label it, the GitHub issue with the label of implementation. Include links to just pseudo codes examples. Discuss implementation through the comments of the issue with PEs, team, with team lead, PEs, architects, etc. cetera. Um, add, oh, I can never spell that, arc, what did I spell wrong? Is that not right? Oh, there we go. Add a link to, add a link in the ticket to the GitHub issue. So there you go. Um, your team lead would like to continue trying this approach to see if this helps. That's me. Okay, that is it, you guys. That's all I wanted to review. Are we all good on this? Um, yeah. Question, have you shared this with other team leads? You know, some no, of these? I'm sure they're doing something similar, but no, I haven't. Okay. This right here, when it, naming our commits, that is something that the other team leads are addressing with their, their devs in some time in the future. Everything else is kind of just kind of us, you guys. All right, well, thanks everybody for joining. Um, if you forget, any of this stuff, don't worry, it's not a big deal. I think you've noticed that I've been kind of, I've been included in your functional reviews and your acceptance test to decompose things just to kind of add comments here and there. Don't, don't feel like I'm gonna critique you on any of this. Um, we'll all get to this point eventually and it'll just be second nature. I don't even expect you guys to 